All right, I hate to interrupt, ladies, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm not nervous at all, so don't think that. I can't believe you would think that. So uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 12. And uh, just one other thing, just after doing this uh, Monday and then today, um, I love my guys, but this is so much better. <clears throat> so Monday came, food, applause during the announcements. Everybody's affirming each other. We began last week just by making fun of Matt. That's what we did. So guys are totally, totally different. So excited to jump into God's word uh, together. So we've looked a lot at Genesis chapter 12 on Sunday in your groups and now here. So I'm going to back up and look at just chapter 12. We'll get a little bit into 15 at a macro level. So what are the two big things that are going on? Well, it's God's covenant with Abraham, first three verses explicitly. And then verses 10 to the end of the chapter is a really, really strange story about Abraham, Abram at this time, going down to Egypt. So let's look at that first scene in the story, uh, verse 1, Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now let me just stop there. We're going to read that verse 3. But what do you think, if you all just talk back to me for a second, what do you think Abram is thinking at this point? What's that? <laughs> Are you talking to me? Yeah. Are you talking to me? That's, that's a good response. And another might be, who are you? Right? Because God's not, you know, it's not like he just left church, right? There are no churches. There's no synagogues. There's no Jewish nation. There's no chosen people. God's not having conversations with people. So, yeah, that, those are the big questions. What else do you think he's thinking? Where am I going? Yeah. Go where? All these kind of things. Um, so anyway, you fast forward to Hebrews 11. We read it on Sunday, but Abram is known as this incredible person of faith. And man, he really is. I mean, because after God gives him, well, let's just read verse 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And in him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And look at verse 4. So Abram went. He just, what a remarkable thing. He just leaves. He just takes off. And so here he sets out on this journey just believing that God had spoken to him, following this, uh, the command of a God he's never had a conversation with. It really, really is a remarkable thing. And so God is going to give him encouragement uh, for this nation that's going to come from him in two ways. And this is what we're going to talk about the rest of our time. He's going to give him encouragement for what we'll just call the pattern of God, and secondly, from the promise of God. So let's watch how he encourages them from the pattern of God and then from the promise of God. Um, and hopefully it will encourage us. So look at verse 10. Here's this story. Um, now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. He was about to enter Egypt. He said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're one beautiful in appearance. Sounds like a setup, doesn't it? It is. Uh, verse 12. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. They will kill me. They'll let you live. You don't want that, do you? That's not in the text. Just made that up. Verse 13. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and my life may be spared for your sake. And when the woman, when the woman is very, excuse me, when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Uh, for her sake, he dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep and oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. Verse 16 is actually really important. Uh, in fact, skip to chapter 13 and verse 2. This is after they left. Now, Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. So this, this resulted in a tremendous amount of wealth for him. So back to verse 17. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him. They sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Um, it's, a, it's a great, um, uh, really remarkable story. And what's interesting about this is that um, Abram was known more than anything uh, for his faith. And yet, after he did this incredible act of faith of just taking off and leaving, verse 4, this 
seemingly moments later, a few verses later, he doubts that God can keep him. So much so that he presses his wife to do something she should have never done. She was abducted and taken as a servant into the house of, of Pharaoh. So it's true, all throughout the Bible, the great people of the Bible don't fall at their weaknesses, but at their strengths. David was a great man after God's own heart, but he gave away his heart. Uh, Moses was an incredible leader who trusted God, but in one moment, he didn't obey the voice of God. And so here's Abram, this incredible man of faith, but he's failing at the area of faith. So um, as I was reading this, um, Again, God will insert things when you're not looking that weren't in the Bible previously. And this is one of them. You're probably already ahead of me. Did you see something in this, in this story? Uh, there's a famine. Uh, they go down to Egypt. Um, there's enslavement. They go out after the Pharaoh has plagues, and they leave wealthy. Does the story sound familiar? Um, yeah, it's, it's the story of the Exodus. It's really interesting. In fact, I put a chart there on your, on your table. There's a sheet there if you want to look at it. Um, and I, I want to look at the verses. Let's walk through the Exodus. We're going to be in here Sunday, so uh, just because there's such an, an overlap. And I want to read these verses. You can read along if you want to. It will give us a greater <laughs> excuse me, sense of the scope of it. Look at Exodus, or excuse me, Genesis 47. Genesis 47 and verse 13. So what happens is that... Um, uh, Abraham has Isaac, Isaac uh, has uh, Jacob, Jacob has Joseph, Joseph is in slavery in, in Egypt, but he's there actually to prepare the way for his people that are going to come after him, and Genesis 47, 13 says, now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine, so both Canaan and Egypt are experiencing the same famine, Canaan is decimated, um, which is the promised land where they should have been, but Egypt is not. Why? Well, because God took someone out of the promised land, put them in a foreign land to provide a way for their family. And again, a wonderful picture of what Christ has done for us. So here there's a famine in the land. What happens is, is that all the family gets into Egypt. And then if you're just going to go to your right a little bit, you can look at Exodus chapter 1. Here's what happens next. Exodus 1, 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Verse 9. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. And so... Exodus that started out as their salvation became their slavery. It was God's mean to protect them, but now after these hundreds of years, they're now enslaved in Egypt. So what happens next, all the way to chapter 12, is the plagues come. Uh, Moses is the intermediary between uh, God and his people and uh, Pharaoh. And look at chapter 12, if you will. Here's the last kind of dot to connect. That after the last plague, uh, we would call the Passover in Exodus 12, 29. If you get down to verse 33, Exodus 12, 33, here's how it all ended. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before his leaven, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. Uh, the people of Israel had also done as Moses had told them. Watch this. For they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the eyes and the sight of the Egyptians, so they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. So maybe the thoughts crossed your mind. They're going to get out into the wilderness and build a tabernacle. It's going to have tons of gold in it. It's going to have fine linen in it. It's got all kinds of fineries and artwork. How did they have the capacity to do that? Well, it was Egypt's gold. So God created a house of worship, if you will, out of the gold that he provided them from the Egyptians. So again, God's ways are so mysterious, but just like Abram, who left Egypt wealthy, they're leaving Egypt with a tremendous amount of wealth. So all these parallels are taking place. And what just keeps coming back to my mind as I'm thinking about this, back to Genesis chapter 12, Abram has no idea this is coming. 
Um, but even though he doesn't have any idea that it's coming, God is so gracious to prepare him. Now, I want to show you this pattern uh, of how I'm going to deal with you. It's going to happen to you. And I'm even going to explain chapter 15. This is actually going to happen to you. We won't read it, but you go to chapter 15, 12. He actually, God says, there's actually going to be your people that are going to go into a foreign land, and they're going to be there for four generations. And he explains all this to them. Well, why did God do that? Well, I don't know why God did this, but we do know the effect of God doing it. That when the people are in the promised land, and they've only got two-thirds of the promises. They're a great nation, now hundreds and thousands of people. They've been a blessing to the nations. They've blessed Pharaoh, but they still don't have their land. They might be wondering, God's given us two. Is he going to give three of the things that he promised to Abraham? They should be able to think, you know what? Remember the pattern of God. Remember what happened to Abram. God took him into Egypt. God drove him there as a result of famine. And God got him out and God gave him the land. If God did it for him, God will do it for us. And so God is so sweet to us to allow us to go through things that are hard, that are difficult, that we would not want. But there's also instruction there that can't be gained any other way. And what confidence steel should feel the blood of the Hebrews who are enslaved in Egypt because they just know. They have to know. It's, it's their oral history. God is going to redeem us from this situation. So God encourages them with this, this pattern, but also with his promises. And so if you turn to the back of that sheet, let's think about a minute the promises of God. So go back to, to Genesis. Look at chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15. What happens in Genesis chapter 15 is what also happens in, in chapter 19 later. God has taken this big promise that's somewhat vague. It just has general instructions. A land, a seed, and a blessing, go. But all along the way, God's going to give him narrower understanding of what it means, or rather more specific understanding. Here's the circumcision. That's a part of this covenant. Uh, I want to tell you exactly. This is not going to come from anywhere else. It's going to come from Sarai. It's not going to come from anywhere else. And so God begins to give him more specific instructions. And this is a part of that. Chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And the word behold is actually not insignificant. It means just clearly or suddenly. The word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven. And number the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and accounted to him as righteousness. Again, there's this great faith. And as we said, it becomes uh, Paul's understanding of faith. Romans 3, verse 7. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from the Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Now, keep that question in your mind. As we keep reading, look at verse 9. He said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each other against the other. So what's that about? Well, let's just take it on its face value. As these animals, he cuts them in half, so it creates essentially a lane, a path between the two. So you have an animal, and it's, it's cut in two. Um, so why is that? Well, verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. That's very, very important. Uh, you said, I thought there wasn't a covenant. Well, there is, but it's, it's different now. Saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. I don't know how to pronounce the words that are verse 19 and 20 and 21, so just go study that on your own. Uh, research that. Spend some time on those verses. What's the significance of this? Well, let's just back up and think about this story. In that day, um, you didn't have any electronic means by which to sign a contract where you put your finger on the screen or you type it in in the PDF so that contract goes out. 
There was no paper on which to write a contract, and even if you had it, there was no legal means by which you could hold somebody to that contract. And the problem was you still had to enter into agreements about land and all these type of things. And so how did you do that? Well, if you were serious about it, you would take an animal, cut that animal in half. You, two people, two parties would walk between that animal. They would look back, turn around, and stare at that animal and say this. May God do to me and worse if I'm to break this covenant. In other words, they were actually calling on God's judgment to come down on themselves. And so someone just had to figure, you know what, if they're willing to do that, they're pretty serious about keeping this. And God remarkably initiates this covenant and calls upon his own character. And so he looks back at Moses, or he looks back at Abraham and says, look, I, I, I want you to consider this. The only thing you have to count on in this relationship is my word. That's all you have. So you, you, have to, you have to believe in my promise. It's remarkable to me back in verse 8 that he even asked him that question. Um, God, how will I know? I mean, he's not really in a bargaining position, is he? Uh, you don't ask that of God. But God doesn't resent that. God doesn't chide him or check him on that. He just he helps him out. He actually gives him something that relates to his senses, something he can see and touch, feel and hear, because he just knew he needed that. Another way to say that is that, that God condescends. And that's actually a helpful word, but the, when we use the word condescending, we mean that in a negative way, right? Don't be so condescending. In other words, don't speak down to me. But in a broader sense, it just means to come down on someone's level. And so what do we see here? Well, first of all, we see a picture of the gospel, right? That God, knowing our inability to save ourselves, to even trust him that heaven awaits us, gave us his son Jesus. He, he condescended. He came down to us. And it only was an effective covenant because it came through the shed blood of God's lamb. So we know that. But it also helps us because in a, in a day-to-day situation, we're free to ask God anything. God, could you help me in that situation? God may or may not give you something visual or tangible. It's been my experience. Sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. And when he doesn't, I can't fake it. I've tried to do that before. I've got a sign. No, you don't. Okay, you're right. I don't. Um, So what do we do in those moments? Well, our confidence is not in a sign. Our confidence is in the character of God. God is calling us to do what he called Abraham to do. God, is, as you're going through all these struggles, you need to think back to the original promise that I gave you. Or to say it another way, in the promise of God, was given all the grace we need to carry out the plan of God. And the promise of God, he couldn't see it, but there's all this grace embedded to carry out all the plan that God had for him. Isn't that encouraging? So Moses didn't have it, or Abraham didn't have it. Uh, That wasn't the point. Um, And we encourage each other that way. You've got this. You have what it takes. You're stronger than you think. Sometimes those are true. Sometimes they're not, (laughs) you know. One of, one of my least favorite ones is someone says, you know, it's got to get better. You don't really know that. I've thought that before. It got worse, you know, <laughs> a lot worse. Um, so uh, that's encouraging, I guess, as far as it goes, but it's pretty thin. That's not what our encouragement is. Our encouragement is in grace. Um, uh, God will always give us more than he can handle, always. But then he gives us grace to sustain us. So that way, clearly, anything that happens is always a result of his grace. That's where his promise rests, not in our goodness, but in his grace not in our capacity but his willingness to help us when we're incapacitated that's that's what grace is so there's a really really old song called down from his glory it was written by William Booth the founder of the Salvation Army Um, I I love this song for its lyrics but it was it was taken uh, melodically from the Italian song O Solo Mio if you know that song uh from uh, which Elvis got, It's Now or Never. There's nothing to do with our lesson, but all three of these songs are connected because they all came from the same tune. But listen to these lyrics. This is verse 1. It's on the back of the page there. Down from his glory, ever-living story, my God and Savior came, and Jesus was his name. Born a manger to his own a stranger, a man of sorrows, tears, and agony. Listen to the second verse. What condescension, bringing us redemption, 
that in the dead of night, not one faint hope in sight, God, gracious, tender, laid aside his splendor, stooping to woo, to win, to save my soul. Isn't that good? So rich. Here's the chorus. Oh, how I love him, how I adore him, my breath, my sunshine, my all in all. The great creator became my savior, and all God's fullness dwelleth in him. And so Abraham's great encouragement, our great encouragement, if that God had given him the grace embedded in the promise to carry out all the plans that God had for us. And of course, we understand that plan as the gospel. So the question, if you're in a trial, or if you need to forgive yourself, or if you need uh, whatever you need is this question, do I believe the gospel? That's our promise. Do I believe the gospel? Because if so, the grace to save us and the grace to take us to heaven one day is the exact same grace that can sustain us in whatever moment that we're going through. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, you are you're so good to give us the story of Abram and to see this incredible story of faith. God, we, we long to have such faith. Um, and yet, Father, we fear that it demands so much of us but all the while knowing that our confidence is not in our capacity to act in a certain way or to be as strong as we need to be, but it's in your grace that infuses us to do what you've called us to do. And Lord, we believe that. Father, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.